Happy New Year to everybody. Just out of curiosity, did anybody show up last week? Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, you guys did too? Oh, that's a bummer. That's, that is unfortunate. I'm sorry. And you didn't even have anything to go to. I know. <laughs> yeah, well, this is one of those things. It's like I, I was explaining to somebody earlier. Um, I definitely don't regret us taking that time off. It was a wonderful, wonderful break. It was good to pull back and have, have some, you know, some peace and establish some good rhythms again after a crazy December. But I really miss everybody. I said it felt like one week off felt actually like three or four weeks off. It was really, it was really weird. Uh, but welcome to everybody. Thank you guys for being here today. Uh, one of the things we do in the first part of the, each year is we start off our year with a with, uh, dedicated time of prayer and fasting. So I'd like to invite some, uh, all of you in, into 21 days of that starting on January the 12th. That's next Sunday through February the 1st. That's 21 days. Now, f- uh, the way fasting is, what we believe is, is it's a very personal thing. So that, um, we're not going to tell you what you have to fast. That's between you and God. So for some people, it might be a meal. It might be social media, it, it might be trying to include new behaviors, new habits, but most of all, it's, it's also creating deeper space for, having, it, it, for your relationship with Jesus. And so over these, those 21 days, we encourage everybody to participate and get involved and be a part and see what God does. It's a wonderful way to start your new year, knowing that you are aligning your heart and soul and life um, towards Jesus for, to, in, in great anticipation of the year to come. So that is coming up. I'll speak a little more on that in, in, uh, starting uh, next Sunday as well. Let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to make our hearts ready for his words. Once again, Jesus, we are so honored that we get to be here. Uh, church is not an obligation. It's being with the people of God, and that, that is church. It's being together to worship you. It's living life alongside of one another as we move towards the cross of Christ. It's, it's a blessing and an honor to be able to lift our songs to you and to be able to adore you. And so Lord, I thank you for this new year, this very first Sunday of 2020. And we just pray blessing over it. We pray blessing over this entire year. We pray, Lord, that you would speak through your scriptures to the deep places of our hearts and lives and souls and myself included in this. We ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us in these words. Let me not get in the way of what you want to say, but say everything through me that needs to be said. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last year, uh, towards the end of the year and towards the end of the Consumed series, I preached a message about how comfort can actually become an idol in our lives when our comfort becomes our life's highest priority. In that message, I showed how, how discomfort, not comfort, is actually the path towards growth, which, you know, probably all of us in here to varying degrees, you know, are pursuers of comfort, not discomfort in our life, ironically. So if you have set in a New Year's resolution, you already know this to be true. Anybody set a New Year's resolution in here today? One person. <laughs> Last service, there was nobody. Okay, two. There was nobody. Nobody. I was like, serious? Nobody? Nobody. I'm not going to... Not gonna do it, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely hilarious. But I, I do know some of all of us in here are hungry for growth, or you wouldn't be in here right now. And I know that if you know that that if you are desiring growth, you know this that anything worth achieving takes hard work. There's no way around it. In achieving anything that you're desiring and wanting to grow towards and grow in, it takes discipline. To get to where you want to be, whether that's physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally, it means that you are going to have to get uncomfortable to get there. There's just no other path. So because this time of year, we're all thinking, even if we're not making resolutions, which is, seems to be obvious as a thing of the past, we're all desiring positive changes in our life. I felt like this would be a perfect series to be able to start our year. So this, this, the sermon that I preached last month could actually be a really good introduction to what we'll be looking at the rest of the month. So I encourage you, if you weren't there for that, for that message, check it out online if you missed it. it would be, it's a great foundation for what we're going to be exploring throughout the month of January. See, we all want to experience healthy growth this year, and in order to do so, we are going to have to get uncomfortable. 
So a question for all of us. When you think about your life, what do you tend to regret the most? What are those places where you look back and you say, yeah, that's, that's a regret? Now, interestingly, studies show overwhelmingly the things that we tend to regret the most in life are not the things that we did that didn't work out. It didn't, it, the result wasn't what we expected but we tend to regret most the things that we knew that we should have done, but we didn't do them. See, we most regret thinking that we didn't reach our full potential. We most regret not becoming the person we feel we could have become, if only we tried. So it's as if, at a soul level, we know the words of Paul in Ephesians 2 10 to be true when he said, we indeed have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works Listen to this, which God had prepared in advance for us to do. So to not do what, we're, we, what we are created to do isn't just a small matter. It's not benign, so to speak. To not do the things that God has prepared in advance for you to do is a denial of your created self. And this is why James 4, 17 says this. If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do, but doesn't do it, it's a sin for them. It's a sin for them. To not do the good that you were created to do is a sin against God because you were made by God to do good things, things that only you can do. So here's an uncom today's uncomfortable truth. Building a regret-free life. Anybody want a regret-free life? Of course you do, right? Building a, re a regret-free life means that we have got to be willing to do hard things. And hard things never make us comfortable. Hard things are awkward. Hard things are hard. That's the name, hard things. And think about it. What's some of the hardest things that you've ever done in life? Maybe it was going back to school to start a new career. Maybe it was creating and upholding boundaries with a toxic person in your life. Maybe it was willingly entering into the sorrows and the hardships of another person and carrying their burden with them. Maybe it was becoming your own boss and starting your own business. Now think about the good that's come from doing those hard things. Think about how God has used the process itself to shape you into the person that you are today. See, the funny thing is, even when the things don't turn out as expected, that same study shows that in the end, most people rarely regret having done those hard things. They would say, yeah, you know, the business didn't quite turn out how I wanted it to turn out, but man, it made me the person I am today, and it opened up these other opportunities that I'm experiencing and enjoying right now. See, because it seems that this is a universal truth, that hard things not only produce good things, but it's also a key to living a life without regret, doesn't it make sense that God doesn't shy away from asking his people to do extremely hard things in this life? You know... I don't know how it is. I don't know if like, you know, God sees, I don't know how he sees everything at once, but he does. But he does, oh, you know, they're so comfy right now. I would hate to disturb them. I'd hate, I'd hate to unsettle life right now. He, he doesn't. Otherwise, why would he do the things that he does all through scripture and in our lives even today? He asked some Hebrew boys to stand against the king, even if it meant being thrown in a lion's den or a fiery furnace. And a curiosity sick, who would choose the lion's den and who would choose the furnace? Lion's dens, anybody? Yeah, I, I go furnace. He asked, he asked people in, in a family-centric culture that goes beyond our understanding of what even family means, he says it's necessary at times to even deny your own family in order to follow me. He asked Hosea to marry a prostitute. Now, wouldn't you be scratching your head, single men in the room right now? Serious? Okay. He asked Isaiah to go around and for his sermon illustration, preach naked for three years. I can hear Isaiah saying, do I get to keep my tunic? You know, like something. Naked. Buck naked. I don't think people are going to listen to me. Doesn't matter. Can I keep my sandals? 
I, that, if I tried that tactic, it would last maybe like three seconds. I'd, I'd be tackled in the front row. He'll say, something happened to Jason. Nobody would come back. See, all of these requests, they're extremely difficult requests, and every request made people feel uncomfortable. See, few stories capture this more clearly than the story of Noah from Genesis 6 and 8. And that's what I want to look at, the first part of Noah's story today. Here's the context. Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. Now, you compare this to creation just a few chapters ago. When God created everything as it was meant to be, he looks and it says he saw and he declares over creation, it's good, again and again and again. It's good, it's good, it's good. And now he's looking at creation in this post-fall world, and he's looking and he says, it's wicked. It's broken. It's bad. See, sin was, had spread like a virus, and it was corrupting the entire system. Things were so bad at this point in Genesis that it actually states that God regretted creating us. There's only two times that scripture says God regrets something. Here in Genesis, and then later when he regrets placing Saul as king. And then here's the reason. It goes on to say that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart, there it is, the human heart, that is, that is always ground zero for the things we do, the good and the bad. It was only evil all the time. That's the context of Noah's world. See, great need necessitates great action if anything is going to change. So this is why verse 7 seems, it seems so strong. It seems like such a harsh thing to do. But we understand what's going on. This was the only answer. Things had gotten this bad. Verse 7 says, So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. Now, the funny thing is, there's people in here right now that nobody cares about the humans. Oh, yeah, they're bad. But they're all oh, the animals. The puppies were dead. Forget about those kids that were starting those brats, but the kitties. <laughs> For I regret that I made them. So have you ever assembled something? If you're like me and you ignore the instruction book, it's like a personal challenge. Can I do this? Can I build this thing without the instructions? And I get to the end, I'm like, yeah, I did it. But then there's those times where you're like, oh, shoot. And I go back to instructions. Oh, I got to go all the way back to the beginning. I got to undo all of my work in order to put a stupid screw in this spot that I missed from the beginning. See, this is what's going on. Only God isn't fixing his mistakes. He's fixing Adam and Eve's mistake. He's fixing their sin. It was them who broke creation, not him. And yet here he is now, having been forced to go back to the beginning, to strip things back as close to the garden as he possibly can. So in God's wisdom, he knew if there was any hope for a future, he would have to do this. See, he would, he, would, he would do a system reboot, so to speak, that would purge the world of the extreme wickedness that had spread into the hearts of man. But he wouldn't start completely over. There was one man named Noah who was different from the rest. Verse 8 says this, But Noah, now again, contrast this, this extreme wickedness is found in the heart of every man, wickedness that is persisting all the time. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now think about this. Whenever God asks you to do something that's hard, it's not because he wants to make your life difficult. It's not because he wants to make your life miserable. So often we think, oh, this must be because I did something. I screwed up a year ago. I did that one thing, and now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm paying the piper. Is it that? Or is it something else? Maybe it's because you found favor in his eyes. See, this is today's uncomfortable truth that he asks, God asks people he trusts to do hard things. See, it's because God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he believes in you. Isn't that strange? I mean, we, in our relationship with God, we say, you know, you have to believe in God in order to be saved through Jesus. We, we, we understand that side of things, but then there's this flip side of things that you have to understand that God believes in you. He believes you are worth it or he wouldn't have sent Jesus to the cross. 
He believes that you can endure under the pressures of this world or he would never have allowed you to go through those things you're going through. God believes that you will not be crushed by the weight of the task that he's asked you to carry. God chose you to be here in this time and place because he believes that you are here for such a time as this. You know, think about, you, you, you could have been born in China in the 300s, right? You could be, you know, if Jesus doesn't come back and bring heaven and earth with him, you could be born on, in, in earth in the year 3000, and it's a desolate place. <laughs> you could have, but you're here. Right now, you're in this time and in this place because he has good work for you to do. If he didn't think that you could do the thing that he's asked you to do, he wouldn't ask. So why did God choose Noah? Was it because Noah was somehow like morally faultless in this world that was full of wickedness, as if somehow his heart was free and exempt from the effects of the fall? See, while Noah was clearly not like the people around him, he was far from being a morally perfect person. Does anybody know what he does immediately after he gets off the boat? Like he goes out, plants a vineyard with the intention of getting drunk. That is a lot of premeditation. (laughs) You're like, how long does that even take? Like to plant a seed to let it grow into a, vin- into a vine, to get the grapes, to crush the grapes, to ferment the grapes. You're talking like a couple of years at least, right? Yeah, but five years. Thank you, Deborah, who worked in vineyards. She knows. Five years. And this whole time he's going, oh, it's going to be worth it. I got to forget that whole ark thing. That's Noah. And what does he do? He gets drunk and he acts like a total butt to his whole family. That's Noah. But in spite of his imperfections, there was something about Noah that gave him favor with with God. God taps Noah on the shoulder and says, listen, I'm going to destroy the world by flood, but in order for you and your family and all of creation to be saved, you're going to have to build a giant boat. Now, this story completely suffers from familiarity. We've heard it so many times, especially as kids. I mean, even if you weren't raised in church, there's a good chance your nursery was decorated in Noah's story, right? Yeah, it, it, so we, we hear it. We hear it all the time. But think about the task that God was asking Noah to do. It's unlikely that Noah had any experience building boats. He lived in a desert. It'd be like, now I'm, I'm assuming there's no rocket science, scientists in this room. If there, it kills the, kills the imagery, the, the, the example. But it'd be like God tapping one of us on the shoulder and saying, I want you to build a spaceship. And you're going to build a spaceship and you're going to space. Your family's going to get in it. I'm going to put a bunch of animals in it. And then I'm going to destroy the earth, cleanse it, and you're going to come back down. How am I going to come down? I'll tell you that later. You're going to come back down (laughs) and you're going to land. And the world will be saved because you built a spaceship. Like, I didn't know where to begin. Like, I would blow up. I'm sure I would blow up. Now, this has got to be, no, be like, I don't even know what a boat is. There's no water around me from miles away. And yet God tasked Noah with his difficult task anyway, in spite of the fact this probably wasn't in Noah's skill set. God gives him the game plan. He says, listen, I will give you the game plan. I will give you the specs. I will take care of you. All you have to do is do it. And what does verse 22 say? So much of Noah's life is summed up so powerfully in this tiny, tiny verse. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Let me say that again. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. This is why God chose Noah. Noah was willing and he obeyed God's command. This is why he was different from the people around him. People who did their own thing, their own way, their own own lives and said, I don't want anything to do with God. Noah trusted God and obeyed his commands. See, think of all the excuses Noah could have given God. I mean, I could just think of some really good ones. If I were Noah, these would be my excuses. I don't even know what an ark is. I've heard of a boat. I've heard of a pontoon. I've heard of a sailing ship. I've heard of a battleship. I've never been on an ark. What the heck is an ark? How can I build something I've never seen? Noah could have said, I'm allergic to cats. (laughs) This is going to be a serious problem. They just, they absolutely send me in a tizzy. He could have said that. He could have said, I'm scared of dogs. 
I don't like alligators. He could have said a thousand things for the thousands of weird creatures that were on the boat. He could have said this, and this would have been a very good and valid excuse for most of us. I'm too old to do this kind of work. At this particular time in Noah's life, Noah was 500 years old when God asked him to start building the ark. Now, if that were me, again, I think I would have been like, it would have been nice if you could have asked me in my 200s. <laughs> I mean, in my 200s, my knees were better, my back was a lot better, I was more spry. Why did you wait until my 500s to ask me to do this thing? See, what this says, though, to us says something pretty powerful. It says to us that even if we've missed some opportunities in our life to do hard things that create good things, it's never too late in God's eyes to start. It doesn't matter how many opportunities you missed in the past when you hear God tap you on the shoulder right now, it is an opportunity today to start aligning your life to God's commands in your life. There's always an opportunity as long as you have breath in your lungs to align your life to be the recipient of the blessings of obedience. You can start at any time, it's which we see here with Noah. Now, side note, people seem to have lived a really long time in between the garden and the flood. See, this could account for the extreme wickedness that grieved God's heart. I think this, that their fallen human hearts had too much time to go in the trajectory they were going in. So C.S. Lewis says this about hell. He says, what makes hell so horrific is that an angry person has an eternity to be able to become fully, in, to be able to embrace the anger that's inside their heart. So if you think an angry person is a miserable person that lives about 70 years in this life, imagine what an angry person looks like after a couple millennia. He says, that's hell. And that's what it looks like. People turned over to the wickedness that is inside of their hearts. And I think that that's what's going on here. Too much time to embrace the wickedness. Too much time, idle hands, right? Too much time to become the people their hearts were steering them to become. But back to Noah. Noah had a lot of good excuses, in my opinion, why he shouldn't do this difficult thing. But what does that one verse tell us? He didn't. He didn't give any excuses. He, he heard the voice of the Lord, and he was willing to become uncomfortable to do hard things because God asked him to. See, this is why Noah is an obvious candidate for the Hebrews Hall of Fame for faith in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 7 says this, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that is keeping with faith. So if discomfort is the path towards life and growth, it'll only be treaded upon by faith. You will never walk willingly into uncomfortable things unless faith is driving you. See, faith is what made Noah say yes to God's command. He actually believed that the things that God spoke were going to happen. Faith is what kept him going during the long days of construction. So it was just him and his family, his boys, that were building this massive ship and without power saws. Imagine, and after like a day of that, all right, we only have a thousand more to do. Faith kept him moving in the direction he felt God had spoke to him, that he knew God had spoke to him. Faith is what silenced the critics in his ears who must have been screaming at him and laughing at him, saying, look at old man Noah, he's lost his mind. But faith kept him going. See, faith is a secret sauce to living in an uncomfortable and yet absolutely fulfilling life. But what is it? How is it obtained? Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about, we, about what we do not see. See, hope is a belief in the future that God has spoken. So many of us have things we feel God has put in our hearts, a future that we are looking towards, a future we believe God has spoken in our life. That's having a hope for the future. Faith is the actions in today that align your life up to that future. So for an example, if I believe that a bus is gonna come and pick me up at one o'clock p.m., I am going to align my actions accordingly. 
I'm gonna go to the bus stop. I'm gonna sit there about 12.50, so I'm not gonna make sure I don't miss the bus. And I'm gonna sit there patiently waiting, believing that the bus is going to show up. Even if it's a few minutes late, according to the schedule, I'll say, eh, it'll be here in just a few moments. I will anticipate its arrival with my actions. And it's the same way what faith and hope are. See, Noah heard the voice of the Lord and he knew that this future was a certainty. So what does Hebrews say? It says, in holy fear, he built the ark that would become his family's salvation and salvation from God's judgment. In doing so, he became heir of righteousness. In his act of faith, what did it do? It gave life for all of creation. We, thousands of years later, are the recipients of Noah's act of faith. See, you never know what's going to come from your obedience to the hard things God asks you to do. Right now, it might not, might, it might not make sense. You might be in the moment saying, this, is, this just seems so far off. I don't get it. I don't get what good is going to come from this. It might be a generation later, maybe even a hundred generations later. Your act of faith has the opportunity every single time you initiate faith to change eternity. You won't see all the, the complete picture until you're in eternity. So how do we develop this kind of faith, a faith that enables us to be uncomfortable when necessary? to do the hard things that produce great things in our life. Genesis 6, 9 says this, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. That last part, that's the key. He walked with God. This is why Noah found favor with God. Not because of the things that Noah did, which those things were important, but those things were the outcome of him walking with God. You see, to Noah, God was his friend. They had a relationship with one another. So to the degree of faith that you can exercise, it's largely dependent on the trust that you have in the relationship. Noah walked with God long before he was tasked with building the ark, and maybe that's why it took God 500 years to ask him. He had to get to a place of walking with him for not just decades, but centuries to say, Noah, I got a job for you, and it is a very, very big job. So when God asked Noah to do this crazy thing, he didn't flinch because he trusted in the one who made the request. So if you're finding yourself unwilling or, un, or reluctant to step out in faith, and you struggle to do hard things that you know that you're supposed to do, the solution always comes back to this. Deepen your walk with God. I mean, it seems so simple, yet it's so profound. It's the meaning of life right there. Walk with Jesus. Walk with him. Study him like you studied your spouse when you dated, and you probably still should. You know, for the single people in here who are hoping to get engaged one day and to be married, what do you do when you date somebody? You study them. Not in a creeper way. <laughs> but, you, but you want to know what makes them happy. You court them, don't you? In the same way you do that with God. Find out what, what, what makes God giddy with delight. You study him, you know him. Commit this year to growing in prayer, in silence, in solitude, in the study of scripture. And, and no offense if this is your Bible reading plan, but it's gotta be more than one verse while you're sitting on the toilet. It just does. I mean, that's a great start. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw shade completely on you. I mean, it's a good start. It's better than zero verses while you're sitting on the toilet. But it's got to be deeper than that if you're actually going to study God's word to see the big picture so you can see with clarity more clearly who this God is that loves you. So do something to grow your relationship with God. And what will happen is you'll naturally find yourself willing to take greater steps of faith when he taps you on the shoulder and says, I got a job for you. It's a hard job, but I know you could do it. Will you feel, feel ready when the moment comes? I'm sure not. I'm sure Noah didn't feel ready, but you'll be willing. And that's what made Noah's life so great. When you decide that your walk with God is going to be more than just lip service, but actually a relationship with the creator of all things, you'll discover something about him. He is absolutely irresistible. He's irresistible because he's done hard things first on your behalf. 
Like Noah, the salvation of the world was placed on his shoulders. Somebody said this, just as Noah obeyed God by climbing onto a boat to save a few, Jesus obeyed the Father by climbing on a cross to save the many. See, because Jesus chose to do hard things, we're saved from judgment. Because Jesus chose to take on him the wrath, because Jesus chose to take what should have belonged to us and gave his life for us, we receive new life. So when we think about what he's done, is, it, is there anything that we wouldn't do for him? When we realize how much he's done for us, when we realize how much he adores us, how much he pursues us, how much he woos us, is there anything that he can't ask of us realizing what he's done first for us? So if the worship team would come up right now, I'll close with a few questions. What would this look like in your life this year? There's a saying that you gotta eat your frog for breakfast. Anybody hear that? Like unless you're, unless you're from Louisiana, you know, and, and frog legs are on, on the menu. It's like most people don't like eating frogs. That's not the thing you like to look forward to, right? But the idea is it tastes like chicken. <laughs> But the idea behind this is that if you eat your frog to br for breakfast, you know you've done the worst thing that you're going to do that day. You know that you've got it behind you. And once you've done that hard thing, then you realize something. You say, well, that actually wasn't even as bad as I thought it would be. It did taste like chicken. And you realize that you can also conquer the rest of the day because the hardest thing is already in your rearview mirror. So what is the hard thing that you've been putting off? What is the hard thing that you know that you're supposed to do, that God has tapped you on the shoulder and said, it's time to do this thing because I believe in you and I believe you can do it. What is Jesus put in your heart and what is he pulling you towards? Where he's saying it's time to align action to the hope that you have. What are those things? For some of us, we know immediately because we've been putting off the hard thing for a long time. And for others, it might be a, uh, an issue of prayer that we need to take into this week to ask the Lord, what are those things that I need to do, those hard things that you need to lead me into so that I will live 2020 without regret? So let's stand to our feet and I'll pray blessing over us that we'd have the courage to do hard things and we'll close in prayer. And we'll close in one last song. Just do this if, if this message resonated with you. Just put your hands out in front of you as a sign to the Holy Spirit, a welcoming sign to say, fill me with your spirit to do the things you're calling me to do. Holy Spirit, give us the courage to be able to not shy away from hard things this year. But those things that we know that you're calling us into, we would go towards them knowing that those are the path towards life. Yeah. That good is going to come in Jesus' name yeah. because we didn't run from the hard things. Yeah. But we willingly walk into them, Lord, yeah. because yeah. you first did. Yes, Lord. And if you did it, and if you did it on our behalf, then certainly we can do these things on your behalf. Yes, Lord. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would fill us with courage this year. I pray that you fill us with a might this year that we would not run from these things. And if we already know that we're supposed to do something, I pray we would not delay, we would eat the frog, so to speak. We wouldn't, we wouldn't put it off and keep putting it off, but Lord, we would do it, even, maybe even today, maybe even this week, yeah. so that we would move through it and we'd be recipients of the life that comes from it sooner rather than later, and we would live in this year without regret. Help us, God. Help us to be people like Noah. Put a deeper desire in all of our hearts to walk with you and to know you as friend. And we may trust you when you tap us on the shoulder and you task us with the hard thing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.